Auckland's North Shore represents a population base larger than that of Dunedin, with 150,000 people living in the area, versus like 130 for Dunedin. As a location, it's one of the oldest parts of the country, and one of the oldest parts of Auckland. So I was really thrilled when Councillor Richard Hills agreed to sit down and have a quick chat with me. At the moment, they're doing everything for the council from home, so as you can imagine, time is very much of the essence. And at the same time, he's busy preparing for a new arrival coming into the family very soon as well. So just to have half an hour to sit down and talk to him was absolutely brilliant. It's fascinating for me seeing how something like a super city like Auckland works differently to other councils around the country. It's our only super city and it represents 1.6 million people. That's a lot of different voices that have a lot of different opinions about everything you could possibly imagine. And Richard's gone out of his way to try and bring on not just a youthful outlook but a futurist outlook as well. Someone who is looking towards the future and to changes that will get made now that generations down the line are going to reap the benefits of but are also going to have to pay off. And how you find that balance in there as well is a tricky thing for any elected official to try and get through. So I hope you enjoy this interview. It was absolutely brilliant to sit down and finally talk one-on-one -on -one with Richard. Um, I hope you enjoy what he has to say. Good morning. Kia ora. I have just lost you. I can... <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Classic. I would have thought by now you would be like a Zoom expert. Oh, we use Skype for business for oh. council, which is like living in the 80s. So Yes. Um, it's terrible. We were changing to Teams uh, just before the outbreak so then that got kind of cut short so what i feel like has happened is that we've got an even older less upgraded system than we had last year um so we i drop out all the time um all That's sorts of issues gotta be frustrating yeah i think i think it was i don't know some excuse was used at the beginning that it was like safer you know and i'm like who is breaking into our council meetings to see like important votes on regulatory items like i don't think anyone are, are your council meetings streamed uh yeah so the big uh committees are but like all our workshops and all the oh, yeah. other small briefings are not so um so yeah so there's, there's streaming of skype which is largely just a black screen with like 104 people participating that you see when you watch the live stream <laughs> you haven't got the the wipe district council fame thing going yet no because we generally if anyone turns their uh, video on the whole thing crashes so um it's not a great time that's not a great setup <laughs> <laughs> no. democracy for the win um yeah i think it was just because well i don't think really pre uh covid last year that there was many um you know S skype meetings uh, and i only ever used teams for you know offline well, we all use Teams, like if yeah. I have a meeting with staff or catch up on anything, it's always Teams. Um, but then our official meetings all go through Skype, and I don't know why. So, Because um, it's cheaper? Uh, no, no, well, th that shouldn't be an issue if it's better, but it's just they haven't got around to figuring out. And I think trying to teach 170 elected members how to use something new is a nightmare for the staff. <laughs> yeah, actually, that that does make a lot of sense. <laughs> and, and to be fair, you are the youngest elected city councillor at the moment, aren't you? No, I'm the second youngest now. So last term, I was the youngest, and now yep. Shane Shane Henderson, who got elected in Waitakere, replacing Penny House, he's six months younger, so he beats me. Oh, that's yeah, not I know. good. But, but at life, the time you were first ruined. elected... You were yeah. the youngest. So, oh, yeah. so you two are pretty much digital natives anyway. Yeah, so we end up helping all our colleagues. With <laughs> so um, I was, many years ago when I was working in Hamilton, I was talking to one of the ancient mayors that they had, and he had this theory that young people don't like getting involved with politics because they see it as an old person job. That's because it was an old person's job. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, at the time, it's, he, he, he looked like Mr. Burns, actually. It was kind of weird. <laughs> Very, very yeah, strange I mean, man. Yeah, that was definitely why I got into it because uh, at the time there was only sort of retired people. Not that their views aren't worthy, but to have only retired people yeah. in elected positions is not good for um, good decision making. That was actually one of the reasons why I wanted to have a talk to you because 
uh, for 20 years, I've seen people try and get youth votes and youth voices around elected bodies and tables, and it's just had no joy whatsoever. But yeah. you've been very successful in that. And I'm kind of curious as to what your secret is. Is there a secret to it? Or is there sort of an outlook that's different that made it a bit easier for you to get on there? Or Because I, I realized that your first council vote was very close. Like it was, it was yeah. like less than 200 <clears throat> votes difference between you and the next person. Um, but but was there like an attitude that you brought into it that, that engaged people more? Or? Um, I'm not sure if there was a... Uh, a secret to it. I mean, I got elected to the Kaipataki local board before the council yes. role. Um, and yeah, I sort of didn't know what I was getting into. Um, <laughs> really. Um, it was the new, it was the first uh, election of the super city. And I sort of stood with a team. And I think at some point they were sort of like, Oh, we just need a younger person to stand and he'll run the, the online part of the campaign. And then I just sort of try my best. And, yeah, got elected there on quite a short margin as well. But it was, I think it was 24 candidates and I was eight, so I got on mm -hmm. um, as, as eight. Um, but I guess the secret is probably what all the elected members need to do, regardless of age, is just be a nice person, <laughs> be genuinely... I, I, I'm going to bite my tongue there because I've met a few <laughs> who are not. <laughs> yeah, I know. Or I guess um, show a veneer of, of niceness. Um, the, 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 and getting your name out there and being like kind of clear on your values. So I think the first time I got elected on Kaipatsky and the first time on, uh, the Auckland council. So that was 2016. I think both times I kind of didn't expect to get elected and kind of didn't. So my skin in the game was, oh, well. I probably won't get elected, so I might as well just go hard on the things that I find important and just be like, not worry about like <laughs> what people are thinking, if you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. oh, you know, saying something about public transport might be seen negatively or climate change. You just, if you're out there just saying what you believe in, because you're actually, I mean, obviously I wanted to get elected, but I wasn't like going to ruin my life if I didn't, if you know yeah. what I mean? Some people treat it as like a job that, oh my gosh, I better just protect my job forever and not talk about anything that's important. Just like stay safe and talk about the rates or talk about red tape or something like that. And, and then those things are never, you know, able to change anyway. It's been a very common theme with the politicians that I've spoken to for this project is that the ones yeah. that that seem to engage best with voters are the ones who don't go into it thinking, how do I win the next election? Yeah. And I think, I, I mean, that definitely does backfire for some, but I think if you, obviously you think about every vote because, uh, you know, you want to listen to the community, but you also, you know, have to do things that are right because I don't want to look back and go, oh, I did that to try and get elected, but actually it was really poor decision-making and it wasn't based on evidence and, we're in a climate crisis or whatever. <laughs> so there are definitely there are definitely things, you know, I, I won't say that, you know, you could put up the rates 20 or 30% and, and achieve a bunch more of the goals that you want to achieve, but you know that that wouldn't be good for individuals, businesses, households, especially during a pandemic. But that probably would also get you thrown out of office. But I think for me, it's the first thing that's more important, knowing that, that would be too tough for people to pay for and too harsh and they wouldn't appreciate what you were getting out of the the outcome of that. And then you, the secondary thing for me is, and that'll probably get me kicked out, whereas other people sort of think even the small rate rises that have to pay for the bare minimum sometimes, like the upgrade to current assets, they're like, no. And, you know, there's people who vote against uh, very small numbers now, thankfully, compared to when 2016. Um, will vote against the rates, but vote for the budget. So they'll vote for everything. And I can't do that. They'll vote yeah. for everything and get as much of the spending in place that they want for their communities and then vote against the, the revenue, which is inevitable. Like no one's ever dropped the rates. I don't think in any council, people talk about it all the time, but unfortunately it's the system we are stuck with um, and the way we earn income to pay for the things that people go, that's broken. There's, you know, poor water quality or, um, whatever the issue is. Uh, so, yeah, I try and 
I think that that honesty, and I know that's funny for a politician um, <laughs> to say, you know, the, the old. It depends on the back. politician. <laughs> but I think honesty sometimes. I think you know, there's a lot of people who I think didn't like me or you know bag me publicly, and I'll like try and catch up with them or meet with them, sort of tell them the whole process without sugarcoating it. And actually, some of those people have come back to me and said, "Look, I don't agree with all your politics, but I think." Yeah, you make a lot of sense and it's better than just you know bullshitting or whatever so that has kind of helped too like being a little bit pollyanna about like well we have to spend this money and what's the outcome you know asking people what they think they would do in my position kind of can reel out some of that um you know general anti-council hate I guess. <laughs> do you come across it a lot? i mean auckland is obviously huge it's 1.6 million people it's the largest population base in the country it's the only super city in the country so you have a lot of dissenting voices <sighs> coming from every angle and every background yeah <laughs> um how often do you find people are just genuinely upset with what the process is that council puts in place or what council is spending their money on? Or is, is there often yeah. a lot of angst around it? I think generally there's like the, the, the general anti-council people that probably don't vote and probably don't get engaged. They're just like totally turned off by council. You're probably not going to win their vote. So it's sort of like just appreciating their nasty comment or the, you know, you're all, you know, I pay your wages and you should listen to me or all that kind of quite angry um, rhetoric. So that's something that you just deal with. But there's the people in the middle who, uh, and there's the people who don't care at all about it, you know, not in a bad way. They're just like too busy and just like, yeah, just get on with it. Just, you know, as long as the, the road has no potholes in it and I can get on the bus or, you know, the, the local park is mown. I'm not really, fo- I don't care at all about your decisions, you know. <laughs> it's, it's not their <laughs> priority. Yeah. But then there's people in the middle who genuinely care and you're trying to like work out how to make everyone happy, you know, like um, we should be going much harder on climate, uh, the climate initiatives. But then I think about the last budget and we got $150 million. You know, I worked through my committee to get $150 million more um, climate initiatives that were, you know, it was the first time we had a climate kind of budget um, and it got a unanimous unanimous support for that. Um, and, you know, there are things that I wish we were going harder, but then every now and then I have to look back and go, you know, a couple of terms ago, we had several climate deniers on the council and like you couldn't get anything over the line. So it's sort of like celebrating the wins and promoting them, but also knowing that other people are going to be like, you're useless, you should be doing triple that or quadru. So it's kind of like the incremental but big leaps. Like it might be incremental in the one year, but if you look back three or four years, um, like on public transport, people say, oh, the public transport system sucks. And then I'm like, when was the last time you took a bus? And they're like, oh, 10 years ago. Or, mm-hmm. or, and it's not perfect everywhere, but if I think even when I was at uni, well, <laughs> 13 years ago, um, you know, it was actually more expensive from Glenfield to the city. The buses were um, the pretty, you know, they didn't have air conditioning or they didn't have, um, you know, heating or sometimes the leather seats were pretty disgusting. And that was only, you know, that short time ago. But actually the paper tickets back then were more expensive than a hop card now to the city. And they were sort of every 40 minutes to an hour. And pretty unreliable they would finish way earlier you know so if you look back you're like oh we've got double deckers now we've got you know five to ten minute services in some places we've got um a hop card which only really came into play about seven or eight years ago um all these different things but i guess people i think Anne hartley who's on the kaipataki local board who was originally um encouraged me to stand um for the local board she's always like people bank things and move on and they just mm-hmm. like want the next thing so it's kind of like always looking to the next thing but trying to like ensure people know also like what their vote has done and what your vote has done and um how, you know how things get built up over time so um, in, in terms of, of the climate committee that you're on what are the big changes that auckland council can make to help deal with the climate crisis yeah, so this term, uh, so last term, I didn't really have a 
I was sort of new. I didn't have a, a role, um, I guess. So I was just kind of like a Finding interested counsellor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And this term, uh, I kind of, uh, the mayor sort of said, what do you want to do? And I said, I'd love to have a climate you know, committee or the, be, you know, Penny Hulse had stood down. So she was the chair of the Environment and Community Committee. And I said, well, and the mayor said, well, what if it was like a smaller um, subcommittee or something? And I said, no, like, I think climate needs to be everyone. So then in the end, he made me chair of a new committee. So there's now four committees of the whole, which means that the mayor and all 20 councillors plus two members of the Independent Māori Statutory Board sit on that committee. So there's four committees of the whole. I'm the Environment and Climate Change one I chair. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, and we, uh, first of all, this term, so this term's been since 2019, so it's a three-year term. Um, and we, uh, first thing I had to do was bring the climate plan through, so Te Tārikia Tāwhiri. Um, it's what the name of the climate uh, plan for Auckland. Um, we worked in partnership with Mana Whenua, so the Mana Whenua Kaitiaki Forum, which is all 19 iwi across Auckland. So probably the first big plan that we didn't just consult with Mana Whenua at the end or like, you know, just ask them to participate in part of it. They were involved from the start, so um, which was really helpful and really positive, you know, which I quite, I, you know, obviously there's racism involved, but I kind of don't understand people's concerns with Mana Whenua being involved in things because they're genuinely just pushing us to do better mm -hmm. in the environment space and water quality, you know, you know, heaven forbid we improve the environment because <laughs> Evie got involved. You know, that's that's largely the, the mantra we get. Um, so we, uh, the plan is for Auckland overall. So the whole of Auckland, we're, you know, working with business, working with individuals, um, different things. Obviously, we need to be leaders as a council. So we're doing things like, um, so from the climate plan, we then it led into the 10-year budget decision-making um, last year, which we approved, um, no, this year, but started at the end of last year. Um, uh, yeah, so $150 million worth of climate initiatives, we, um, which includes rapidly changing up our bus fleet, for one. So there was a plan to never buy a diesel bus after 2025, we brought that forward to this year, so 2021. Um, so we're never buying a diesel or petrol bus again. Uh, we will also have 50% of our bus fleet, um, at least, um, zero emissions by 2030. That'll probably keep moving forward, but some of the buses like the double-deckers um, are all fairly new. So you don't want to create a situation where you're like getting a new bus, but then just putting those buses onto a different council somewhere else, and it's kind of like fake. You know, mm -hmm. you're still creating the yeah. emissions. Um, plus some of those, the even though they're still diesel, they are some of the, you know, the technology is so good that the emissions are far better than, the emission standards and everything are so much better than, you know, buses we were getting in five or six years ago. So there's like a balance of making sure we're not just decommissioning good buses that, and you're creating, you know, wasted um, energy. And so we'll be getting, we're basically rapidly getting rid of the oldest buses first, and which makes sense. Um, we, we obviously have the mayor's million and a half trees, but we've added another 200 hectares of native forest to our regional parks over the next 10 years. Um, about 11,000 mature street trees will go in in places, mostly um, south and central Auckland. In Kaipaski, where we live, we have the highest urban tree canopy, so about 30. 32, 33%, um, whereas in South Auckland, some of those local boards are down like 6 or 9%. Oh, wow. I so, didn't even realise that. Yeah, so we have um, in on the shore, but specifically Kaipatsuki, um, you know, from the motorway over, um, is that we have 540 hectares of native bush and a whole lot more street trees than um, almost anywhere else. It probably helps that we have all these valleys that were undevelopable at the time and, um, you know, when things were subdivided, they're sort of like, can't build on that, let's make it a park or let's use my development contributions, I'll donate that to the council. Um, Anne Hartley was uh, the mayor of North Shore City and Birkenhead who bought the Cody Point and she Shepherd's Park and the whole kind of Queen's chain around the coast. 
which stayed, um, you know, as uh, reserves back in mm-hmm. the seventies uh, and eighties, which was pretty, um, you know, forward thinking. Um, but yeah, so a lot of that tree focus will go South Auckland because we want those kids to be to have the same experience I did as a kid. You know, we've got shady, better air quality. Um, you know, it's a much nicer uh, place to walk than through areas which are largely just concrete and dust and hot. Um, the, those yeah, plus, are also your more yeah. industrial areas around the city as well, yeah. aren't they? So, so, so that's yeah. in, in a way kind of negating that or trying trying to create a more positive effect from that. Yeah, definitely. I think that's the the key thing for people who don't necessarily understand climate change. I'm like, well, the worst thing that will happen is that you get better air quality, better water quality, better water quality. The heat <laughs> is reduced and and amenity is better. You know, that's the kind of um, thing from there. Also, we're going to double our recycling centres. So we'll have 24 community recycling centres, including two resource recovery parks in West and South, which is um, construction waste. You know, some of our biggest uh, emissions for council are our, the waste component. So mm-hmm. reducing um, waste to landfill. You know, some of our community uh, projects at the moment, we're getting zero waste to landfill. City Rail Link, um, they had a, they're doing 98% diversion. So only 2% of the waste from the digging and the leftover, you know, materials and everything. Um, everything else has been diverted to other projects or being used in um, other ways. So we're just, we're trying to be leaders in that space to encourage developers and construction companies and others to kind of copy us. Um, and so those community recycling centres will also enable people to bring their waste, divert their waste, um, you know, and that can be sold back. A lot of a lot of what gets taken to those recycling centres is from the inor- inorganic collections and, you know, old furniture that can be restored or metals that can be recycled. And, um, you know, those were things that largely go to landfill now. And obviously we have to build more landfills, which is not great. And that that um, the emissions underground just last for you know 30 40 50 years um, and we want to want to stop that so those are a few of the things there's a, a there's a longer list we're working with all Marae. Um there's a Maori um, impact fund uh, for across Tamaki Makoto which will help them you know obviously get better energy uh, waste um, disposal planting whatever that is and also uh, Adaptation. So, if they've got low lying urupa symmetries um, and things like that, coastal marae that need support to protect their assets when we get inevitable uh, sea level rise, even if we do our best, we're still going to get, you know, we're, we've got a 1.5 target for emissions, but we realize that we need to also adapt our coastline and cities and streets uh, for a 3.5 world, even if we try our best. We know that there is a, a high possibility we still have pretty destructive um, situations. Do you think the voters are aware of how complicated and intertwined <laughs> all of these issues are? I think some people are really engaged, uh, uh, especially quite a lot of younger people. So, you know, that's what I get concerned about when we, when I feel like we aren't going fast enough. Is like the, the kind of bleak look that the future may uh be and you're making decisions now that are going to affect that 30 40 year outlook um but a lot of people don't understand i think there's a lot a lot of our studies and you know with our uh, climate initiatives through the 10-year budget we had 60 i think it was one of the highest ever you know tick, it's a tick box exercise Forty thousand people submit out of the whole Auckland, which is high but it's not you know very good enough but but you know we had sort of 60 something percent of those who submitted in favour of the climate initiatives, people saying we should go further. That was the same on our water quality and natural environment targeted rates three years before that. You know, that was telling people we're going to add 100 bucks uh, um, a year to your rates. And it was like in the 60, 65% support for that because people are really aware those things are important. So everything from rebuilding our tracks to protect um, Cody to improving the water quality across um, Auckland that that got big support because people are aware it's an issue. So I guess a lot of people are just like, yep, just do just do the work. Um, I'm not too concerned about 
how, but I just... <laughs> we want <laughs> results. Too, we don't need to see the process. Yeah. We don't need to know all the science behind it, but we know it's, uh, you know, concerning. So the, um, yeah, I think, I think people are getting a better idea. I think, um, you know, one of the first things I actually said to my support um, advisor at the time was I don't want to talk about what everyone talks about is, you know, fires and disasters and storms because that kind of depresses people. But then unfortunately we, four months after I, be, or three months after I became the chair, we had fires in Australia, mm-hmm. turned everything orange. We had a pandemic, which was largely to be assumed to be created um, from, you know, taking away uh, habitat for animals, which end up coming into towns and villages and spreading animal diseases to humans um and then you've had floods in Whangarei you've had then this year you've had almost record-breaking um floods across the country including West Auckland a few weeks ago yeah. um and then you had the drought that we had to spend an extra two or three hundred million dollars on to try and bring more water from the Waikato bring on new bores and so what I've tried to explain to people that the smaller uh, you know you could put a few hundred million into um, trying to prevent this stuff from happening or we can keep, you know, spending emergency funds. I mean, New Lynn, I don't know if you remember in 2018, there was massive floods and the whole New Lynn shops yeah. went under. You know, that was like a $50 million um, fix-up job um, that wasn't budgeted for. Our $224 million last year for the drought wasn't budgeted for. We just had to switch everything up. The, we're spending, you know, quite a lot. Of, and insurance money will be spending in QMU and West Auckland. Um, do you remember the, the Rawani car park behind Birkenhead shops that fell yes. on the cliff? Yes. Yeah. So that was that was during the same time as the New Lynn um, stuff. So all that rain constant for, you know, it's funny, we had a year of extreme rain and then we had two years of the worst drought we've ever seen. Um, you know, so although they're not all technically climate, they're all there's some that are very... Um, obvious that the change in temperature and um you know the fact you get long periods of drought followed by you know we get rain within 12 hours that would normally come over two months um uh you know those kind of climate induced disasters <laughs> which cost way more than the actual prevention so i get i I, under, I think people understand that much that we need to do some things that costs money to prevent us continually spending emergency budget. So you've mentioned water quality a couple of times. Um, Yeah. One of the other projects I've got on at the moment actually is a series for a radio station in Hamilton on the changes that central government is bringing into local government. And the big one is obviously the three waters amalgamation there. Um, How does the work that Auckland Council does on things like water quality come into play with that particular three waters outcome that the government wants to to achieve? Yeah, it's funny. I don't know if you can hear when my emails are coming through, but I can see, please oppose the three waters um, emails coming through to my um, email. So the other day we actually, I I guess I'll go through, I don't know which was the best way, maybe what we've resolved as a council so far, but I'll also go through why I think the government's trying to do the right thing and I'm not kind of in this everything's terrible um, situation. So the, I guess the, what we've resolved on is that we support the government's intent. Um, We understand why they're doing it. We just don't necessarily agree with, and probably the mayor and others are a bit stronger, but it was a unanimous vote because it's better to be, get the parts of, you know, that's part of politics is you don't get everything you want, but you get lots of things you want if you work with others. Um, So the, the intent is, you know, we support the intent of wanting to improve water um, infrastructure across Aotearoa. Um, we support the, you know, the need for a, you know, we definitely support the water regulator, uh, the economic regulator and the um, Taumata Arawai, the um, basically drinking water standards across New Zealand because we don't uh, actually have those um, until this comes into play. So that's important. Um, and we support, you know, trying to find out better ways to fund and finance water infrastructure. But what we are concerned about is the governance um, around it. So at the moment, uh, we have water care. Um, but what this would do is obviously split 
the water agencies into four across New Zealand instead of 68 we have across yeah, New Zealand. Yeah, and it's a lot to juggle. Yeah. And but the governance is a entity that then appoints a independent panel who then appoints a board. And we're saying that one, two, three, and then we would only have an effect on the one um, just doesn't make a lot of sense um, and it's too far removed from almost anyone not saying that these uh, there'd be a lot of safeguards in place but not saying these people would do anything bad you know but it's kind of you to have that much distance between the governance and the the people is our big concern so you know there could be a a panel that appoints the the board and that might be good um the issue what and the government's issue, and it's been looked through like standard and pause and the ratings agencies, is that to actually be a, have the capacity to borrow a lot more and a lot cheaper, it would need to be completely separate from council. Um, it couldn't it couldn't have any flow back to council's you know uh, responsibility because then you just can't borrow more money, and that's part of the problem. We are stuck at our borrowing limit. Um, we have increased our um, water spending over the next 10 years by, I think, it's about $8 billion. Um, and that's still nowhere near enough. We have no, so we're probably the best. And that's not just because we're Auckland, because water care is pretty, pretty good. It's shown in the, in the drought. There is issues there. But, you know, we're on every metric on water quality, drinking water um, supply, you know, that sort of thing, we're, we're way up there and would pass, you know, any water regulator kind of um, achievements. But the issue is we have no budget or plan for future water supply. So as shown through the drought, there was issues, but we don't have a plan for, um, is it wastewater recycling? Is it, you know, there's no more space for dams. Like what, you know, with that 8 billion we've just added, that does mean we're doubling our water bills over the next 10 years. So, you know, Aucklanders need to know the current, you know, everyone's, emailing me worried about the cost but what we have in the budget now is doubling our water bills within 10 years because that's the only way we can pay for the infrastructure and the maintenance and the upkeep um but we can only borrow in 10 year increments as a council whereas a uh, say an agency that would be set up could borrow over 40 years which makes more sense because mm. you're building pipes in the ground that last 40 50 60 years but You'd never pay a, you know, you're not, well, definitely not now. You know, paying a house back over 10 years doesn't make sense. I know we're not, it's very different to a, a, house, a household mortgage, but you're literally requiring one or half a generation to pay for um, infrastructure that's going to last a couple of generations. Um, and we just don't have the borrowing capacity because of our debt head room. But what this agency would enable would be far higher um, debt earlier which means the cost of maintenance reduces over time because right now we kind of have to sweat our assets and, and if you look at places like Wellington others they're sweating them till they break literally into the pavements mm -hmm. and then they replace them because um, they have an even smaller rating base uh, than us you've got the far north who has 17 uh, wastewater and water supply uh, treatment plants but all at the end of their life but they have no money to pay for it You've got Havelock North, 5,000 people got sick and four people died from the water supply. You've got Dunedin, who recently had an issue with potential lead in their water supply. Kaipla went bankrupt when they couldn't pay for their... Um, and part of that is because people have kept the rates too low for too long. I mean, Auckland's, we, when we did our water quality targeted rate, that was largely because Auckland um, City Council, the old, you know, John Banks kind of era council, um, they spent... They pushed out their renewals 89 years but, so they could keep the rates at the lowest possible. Um, so it was on the books, but largely none of – some of the, those pipes are 100 years old in the city centre. They've never been separated like we did on the shore, which is separating the – you know, people don't understand that Auckland city um, areas, the isthmus, it's designed to overflow. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not an accident when it does. It's actually designed during rain to overflow um, into the the harbors and streams. Like it's not it's not an accident when it happens <laughs> on the shore. 
there are issues and that we've started to fix them with the water quality targeted rate quite quite a lot um but that is more broken or illegal infrastructure when when a house is built and they plug the wastewater into the water supply or something like that um those are more issues that can be fixed the city center is like billions of dollars of work to replace old infrastructure so so yeah so while people are kind of angry at this assumption that the three waters is bad when i actually ask people or delve a bit deeper i'm like well what do you want quadruple the water um water bills what like i guess what i'm saying is the current uh what we currently have is not right what the government's currently proposing is not right either but trying to uh, trying to please um 78 councils if you include the regionals but 67 different areas if you're trying to build a system that pleases everyone it's it's almost and impo- well it is impossible and we're yeah. find, they're finding that possible what i worry is the government just gives up because it's too hard and it has been taken over by this anti maori type um mm. mantra uh and confusion and of course when people put out videos and the funny thing is is that national party had um was looking at this too cuz local government has been asking for this for 20 years for support in this area um so yeah so it's kind of a, i'm worried the government's just going to throw their hands up and, and say oh well this is too hard and then we end up you know not looking at it for another 20 years and we're in a much more dire situation so yeah i'm not quite as adamant as the mayor that nothing can happen and that we need to hold on You know everyone talks about all oh, these assets that we've paid for are going to go somewhere. They're not going overseas. They're staying in place yeah. and they're staying but they're going to stay as our water supply. And they're going to they might have slightly different ownership but no they are picking up the pipes though. Yeah, that's what I can't understand. Oh, they're not they're not going to give us the money to I might well technically that's what happened with Watercare but slightly different. I mean the ownership we d- we don't have direct decision making power over Watercare. We appoint the board, yes. um it's a very long process if we wanted to get rid of the board overnight and look at the issues with the ceo being the issues we found with them we couldn't it was kind of like public pressure and what well, he stepped down but um you know and that was probably unfair on him and you know he did some really good things as well but um but the you know we don't i think people assume we have democratic rule now <laughs> and, and actually water care some of what has some of the positives about water care is because they haven't had that like you going back to our conversation earlier having that um uh politician scared of making hard decisions because of a neighborhood um yelling at them water care are able to go no we've got to do this sorry and it's going to cost this much or you know they come to us and tell us what the water bills are going to be but we don't have decision making over that we can give them feedback but if they want to triple the water bills overnight actually we the, the mayor and councillors can't stop that under the current model mm-hmm. um so so they're at arms length we set um general uh guides you know we can work with them on the climate plan things like that but if i i i think that the three waters would be too far removed um but i think people will assume we are now sit around deciding which pipes are going in the ground um now which is not actually true <laughs> right. one last question for you because i know you sort of pressed for time at the moment um yep. what advice would you give people to get them through lockdowns and outbreaks and everything else that sort of been thrown at everyone yeah i mean everyone's going to be experiencing differently um i'm a i'm a extrovert and kind of uh hate lockdowns but then I've also learned to enjoy them cuz actually having nights and weekends has been a strange but great <laughs> experience for me like You say that now but you've got a kid on the way that's going to stop soon. Yeah, I know like 6 weeks. <laughs> <laughs> 6 weeks away. So it's probably a good uh, last year I really did learn like oh I don't need to be out every night and I don't need, you know, and taking time for yourself is important and exercise is important you know sometimes you do get stuck into a routine of just having to be everywhere all the time um so now since my first experience has been okay it's okay to sit home on a tuesday night and watch 
Netflix or, or having a Friday and Sunday off is, is actually a normal person thing to do um, and good for your, um, your health. Uh, but I guess how to get people get through lockdowns, yeah, I, I guess it's reaching out, talking to, talking to everyone, uh, making sure you're checking in on what, you know, how you're feeling. It's a pretty strange situation. As humans, I think we always want certainty and there's anything but certainty with this um, situation. You can understand what the government's doing, wanting to keep hospitalizations and deaths to a, a minimum, but at some, you can sort of tell right now it's bubbling over to like, well, why can't we just do what other countries are doing and kind of letting people die, but, but being open and free. So it's a huge gamble for the government right now, but people... There'll be people who are absolutely afraid of opening borders and other people who are absolutely adamant to open them. And, you know, some, some of the people might never have been overseas, so to them it's not a, an important thing for that to happen. Others are desperate to see family um, or whatever else. Uh, so I think that is a hard thing. So stop doom scrolling. I think I need to take my advice, my own advice on that. I think people can get stuck in the, the 1 p.m. updates and the the reading stories and the millions of opinions and social media, the anti-vax stuff, like keeping off social media a couple of days a week or at least, you know, turning, uh, stop looking at that before you go to bed so you don't have the horrific um, lockdown dreams is probably a good thing. Um, and just, yeah, catching up with people, bringing back some of those things you, that were a novelty in the first lockdown. So FaceTiming friends and family you don't normally catch up with, um, you know, cooking, exercising, um, and just, yeah, trying to focus on the good things that you can control because there's a lot about this uh, um, time that we can't control. So, you know, I keep trying to put out kind of positive things and, you know, yay, we're moving forward. But even I'm sometimes regretting that because it's like, yay, nine, nine cases, and then it kind of backfires because the next day they're higher and sort of like, but it's still okay. Um, the trend is going the right way. <laughs> yeah, the trend is going the right way. And I think the more people get vaccinated, the safer we're going to be. And, and I think, you know, there is more tolerance in New Zealand, I think, at the moment for slowly opening things up and understand, you know, I think I don't see a case where we turn into Melbourne with massive protests and those sorts of things. We're a little bit like, yeah, I'm angry, but I'm going to like keep wearing my mask and I'm going to get my family vaccinated and it's, I understand why. So there's, there's some good things about living here that I think will continue even when it gets hard the next couple of months. So. That is brilliant yeah. advice. Thank you very much. <laughs> I want to thank Richard for sitting down and having a catch up with me. As I said at the start of this video, I know full well how difficult it is for an elected official to juggle just everything that they've got on their plate. So I really do appreciate getting an insight into what it is that he's doing and his outlook on things in not just a really large population area, but the population area I live in. So for me, it was great to be able to see exactly what was going on and get an idea of the sense of purpose that he brings to the job. Absolutely brilliant. I've left some links down below so you can check out his Twitter feed because he's very prolific on social media. Um, check out his other feeds as well if you get a chance and give him a follow. I think you'll find them really insightful and the best thing I can say about all of his social media is that he is relentlessly positive and sometimes when you've been locked up for 40 odd days that kind of positivity is a really big breath of fresh air that we could all do with. Until next time, I hope you enjoyed this episode and I will catch you later. Don't forget you can now download all these episodes as well on podcast uh, through Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Uh, I'll put links for those as well down in the description. Until next time, I will catch you later.